in the restroom. Well, I told Scott that we had a great, great week without him, and he informed me he had a great week without me, so <laughs> let's stand and worship this morning.
around you and let them know that you're glad they're here with us this morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Harvest. We're glad you came to worship with us today. If you're joining us online, we appreciate you here. We're going to have a great service today. Um, we're glad to be back from vacation. We had an incredible time with our uh, Becca's family, actually, one of my blood family, Becca's family, in, uh, in Arkansas. I just need to make that delineation. They're my in-laws, okay? <laughs> anyway. It was a great time. Anybody have fun at VBS this past weekend? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to thank everybody for your incredible hard work and all that went into this, and especially everybody was here till about 10 o'clock last night breaking down, and so that was great, and we need to give uh, Ayla a special hand of applause. She did an incredible job. From organizing and telling everybody what to do, but then on top of that, of course, all of the... Uh, writing the actual curriculum for VBS. She did a great job. And thank you for everybody that, that volunteered. We appreciate it. I know the picture's a little bit cut off, but that's the, that's the picture of everybody who attended, all the kids uh, together. So um, um, you'll, I will post or try to post the maybe nearly 100 pictures or so that everybody seems to be sending me. Um, <laughs> matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> Lori's texting me right now. I think right now some pictures. So. Um, but uh, we appreciate everybody and appreciate uh, that we had a great vacation Bible school. Um, today is Acts of Harvest from 3 to 4 p.m. We'll be serving our community for those in need of groceries and uh, prayer and then a hot meal. That's today. If you'd like to volunteer, we'd love for you to be part of that, 3 to 4 p.m. Also, there is a sign-up sheet. Uh, believe it or not, at the end of this month begins the infamous 127 yard sale. Okay? So we need your help <clears throat> as we begin to set up. The last Sunday of the month is actually a fifth Sunday. Normally we would have a fellowship together, but we're going to have a fellowship called Set Up the Yard Sale for the week. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll need your help at the last Sunday of the month. Uh, and that'll be uh, probably in the evening there. I'm not 100% sure, but we'll, we'll figure that out and get you the details. There is a parking sign up, though, for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. There's a sheet on this side of the foyer, out in the, on the foyer table. Uh, you can sign up for a time slot. We will need people to help park cars uh, during the busyness of those times. So we appreciate all your help. And remember that this year uh, for the yard sale, everything that all income, all net income from the yard sale will go directly to missions and outreach this year. So that's how uh, that's going to work. So we appreciate it and appreciate your help in, in allowing this to happen. Um, one other thing uh, in, in reference to the yard sale, um, just to generate some extra income, we will likely uh, go ahead and do a church yard sale once again. And so uh, that week you can bring all your junk. Um, don't bring garbage, just bring no, okay, no junk. Bring all your nice, lightly used, usable items. Okay? You sound like a used car salesman now. It's just junk, if you ask me. <laughs> slightly used. <laughs> slightly junk. There we go. So bring all that that week, and we will sell it. Um, otherwise, we'll throw it in the dumpster. So um, that, that will be that week. Do not, do not free bring junk. Okay? Don't, don't like, don't bring it here to my office this week or, or show up at church with a truckload 
because I will turn you away, okay? <laughs> Show up the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday or Saturday of the yard sale and drop your junk off, okay? Um, just just want to make that very clear. There's no pre-bringing your junk. Wait to do your cleaning until then. Um, so that's going to happen this year. We appreciate all your help and uh, appreciate us getting rid of your stuff for you. Okay. And, and by the way, you don't get any money for it. I just want to make that clear on top of that. It all goes to the church, just to be, just to be sure. Okay. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about church. I don't know what anybody else has. Um, think of, I think about church all the time. You know, I, it's just it's what I live, I breathe, I love the church, have an incredible love my entire life for the church. I grew up in church uh, ever since I was a little kid at First Assembly of God. That's really all that I know is church. And, and I live it, I breathe it, I, I, I think about it, I read about it. And, and I recently read an article this past week by a guy named Mike Glenn, who's a retired pastor uh, from National of a Sizable Baptist Church. And uh, he was writing in this article talking about church attendance and um, in, the, in it, he said, I've, I've had this issue where I've seen that every major denomination, every even independent churches, Christian churches, all of them alike, attendance is down. And this is what he says about it. He said, after 40 years of ministry, here's why I think attendance is down. It's because people have stopped coming to church. <laughs> it's a genius, isn't it? You know, it makes sense. It's logical, isn't it? Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that I can say. If you're an unbeliever, I understand possibly why you wouldn't come to church, even though I think it's probably a good thing for you. Uh, beyond that, uh, uh, if you are a believer, uh, this is the thing, that if you don't like going to church, you may need to reevaluate some of the things that are going on in your heart. If you love Jesus but say you don't love church, then you're really saying you don't love Jesus' bride. Right, sure. And really... It's hard to identify any particular person apart from their spouse, if you will, right? I mean, it's, it's not just one, but it's both. And so I think that if, if we're talking about the church and we're talking about the love of the church, then we should learn to love the church even with all its inconsistencies, even with all its fallacies, even with the, the, the heartbreaking things that do often happen in church. We need Jesus and we need the church. And you don't get one without the other. I really believe that with all my heart. Right. We need both of them. They're a package deal. If you want Jesus, you want Jesus church. He That's died right. for the church. He died for the church's creation. That's and he right. sent the gifting and the power of his Holy Spirit so the church could live in the power of his spirit. Right. And I think sometimes all those inconsistencies are just really lives that are lived without the power of the spirit in their lives. And so we need Jesus we need to think about these things and meditate on these things. I'm just encouraging you. Come to church. Yeah. Love the church. Yeah. Learn yeah. to love the church. I know it might be a little bitter taste at some times. It could even be a little bit boring. I understand that you may get this gut feeling when Ryan sings. Like, I just don't know that that's good. You know, or, or uh, I heard that he gave me a hard time last week, so I got to come back, you know. <laughs> Just learn. Learn to love the church. Yes, learn to love Jesus with all that you are and all that you have. And so this morning, let's begin prayer time. Uh, we did have a prayer request uh, that came this morning. Uh, Johnny is home with his mom, uh, Mildred Campbell, this morning uh, because her blood pressure was low. She got up and she got dizzy. And so uh, possibly that she accidentally took an extra blood pressure medication this morning. Uh, we don't really know for sure, but uh, we just want to pray for Mildred that everything's okay <coughs> and that. Uh, she's resting at home right now, so we'll pray for Mildred in particular. But any other prayer requests that we need to bring before the Lord today? Yes, Kim? Uh, one thing would be nice is to meet with this person with Pastor and Michelle Kelly. Absolutely. Pray for Mike and Michelle. Yeah. Um, Peyton? My mom's going to have to be um, Doesn't remember anything? Okay. We'll pray for Rocky. Absolutely. Yes. Any other prayer requests this morning? All right. Well, let's begin with the Lord's Prayer as we go to the Lord this morning. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we just give you praise this morning, Lord Jesus, that we can come as your church and gather together, Lord. The church is not a building. The church is not a physical place. The church is your people where your spirit dwells among them. And Father, I pray that as your spirit abides with us this morning, Lord, that you would be near to us. Anoint your servants, Lord Jesus, to serve and to do your will, Lord God, upon, and accomplish it upon this earth, not just with the, out of, of uh, some sort of duty or some sort of uh, mandated obedience, but Lord, let us do this with fervency of heart, with love, and be engendered towards you, Lord Jesus, because you're a gracious and loving God. Father, I pray this morning as the, we lift up these requests to you, we pray for Mildred Campbell this morning, Lord, that you would touch her body. Lord, uh, balance her blood pressure. We pray that you continue to renew her body and be near to her in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for Tia's family who uh, passed away this past week, Lord Jesus. We pray that you be near to them. Lord, bring healing and, and uh, uh, as they go through this grief in their lives, Lord Jesus, as they grieve this loss, Lord Jesus, I pray that you be powerfully present in their lives, Lord God. We, Father, we pray for Mike and Cheryl. Uh, cheek this morning, Lord God, that you would touch them, bring renewal to their bodies, uh, Lord, renew their strength, Father God, in you, uh, let even though uh, the bodies, Lord Jesus, are, are, are wasting away, let them be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit, touch their shoulders and back, and give them relief uh, from that pain, we ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that you would touch Rocky this morning, within the hospitals of complications from blood sugar and diabetes, Father, uh, Bring his memory back to him, Lord Jesus, in recognition. Lord, bring his uh, back to his mind. Uh, Father, all that he remembers, Lord, and that his blood sugar be balanced and let his body be renewed and touched, Father God, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just ask you that you would be near, uh, that your grace would be near, Father, especially for this uh, man, uh, this young man, uh, friend, uh, who is a grandfather, is not likely going to live for very much longer, Father. We just pray that you would touch the whole family, uh, be near to his, uh, this friend in particular, Lord God, that, that you'd be with him and comfort him. And Father, as he goes through this grief that many of us all have experienced very similar to that. And Lord, I just pray that your presence would be made known this morning. Lord God, that you would, in a powerful and tangible way, Lord Jesus, make your presence manifest. Lord, if there's some of us this morning... Uh, that may be skeptical about Christianity, may be skeptical, uh, skeptical about healing, skeptical about the presence of God, whether he's really real and re really here as we profess that he is. Lord, I pray that you would make yourself well known in a mighty and powerful way that you are God, and that you are here, and that you are interacting and participating with your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, Amen. Would you stand? Let's worship the Lord this morning.
the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The Stop working. Even when I don't see it, 
presence of God this morning, any time that the Lord breaks in and speaks to us in such a powerful way, the book of 1 Corinthians is very clear that, that sometimes that God's spirit would break in through a tongue, an unknown tongue to us, but interpreted by another, and that's what we experienced this morning. So this is not a rhetorical question. I want you to speak back to me. What did you hear the Spirit of the Lord say to His church this morning. He is the way maker. I am with you always. You can trust Him with everything. Trust me and see what I can do. Come to the Lord. Sorry, Bill. There's no dead ends with me, men. Even when I don't feel it, Jesus is working. Wow. What was it? What's holding you back? Did you catch that? What's holding you back from giving everything? All of who you are. Whatever problems, whatever issues, what giving it to Jesus. Evan, did you have one? Say it again. The light and the darkness. There it is, right there. Amen, Evan. Good job. Wow. Let's just take a moment. Let's just breathe in the presence of God right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you speak. You speak here, right now, with us, in us. Thank you for who you are, Lord. Pastor, you have a word? You just need prayer? Would you gather around? Let's, we need some folks to come help pray for Pastor this morning. Blood pressure. Amen. Would you stretch out your hands? Gather around, Pastor. If you have a need, this seems like this is the time, this is the place. And we need to give these things to the Lord. And the rest of you, as we pray for pastor, I just want you to sing in the background. That is who you are. That is who you are. Go ahead, Ryan, sing that. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch Pastor Hammond. 
Lord, I pray that you would touch his body, Lord, as he chronically deals with this issue of blood pressure. Father, I pray that, Lord, as we read in the scripture this morning, uh, Father, that the power of the Lord was present for healing. And, Lord, I pray right now that you would touch past him. Lord, every ailment, every physical issue that he has going on right now, Lord, we put faith in you and believe, Lord, that you are touching his body. Lord, I pray specifically over this issue of skin cancer, Lord Jesus, that you would, Father God, remove it by the power of the Holy Spirit, divinely touch and heal his body. Lord God, that you would remove every remnant, every trace, Lord Jesus, of anything in his body, Father God. That is not of you. And Father, that you would renew him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, touch him. Strengthen him, Father God. Balance these blood pressures, Lord. And renew this body. Lord, let the strength be, Lord Jesus, just as Moses was. Father God, that in his later days, he was just as strong as he was in his early days, Father God. Lord, let the strength of his mind, his spirit, his body be renewed. In the name of Jesus. has a need and wants to be prayed for, please let's take this time. That is who you are. That is who you are. From it all. Lord God, I pray that you would renew her in the spirit, Lord Jesus, inwardly in such a way, Lord God, that Father, some of these things just kind of fall away in your presence, Lord. And Father, I pray for complete and perfect rest, Lord, to fill her mind and body in peace, Lord Jesus. I pray specifically that there are some anxieties that have been keeping you awake at night. It's not just physical, but Lord, it's mental, it's worries. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You 
never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. My people, I speak unto you personally this morning that all things are possible if you will believe. If you will believe in me, all things are possible, I say. And listen, listen, my people, listen to my voice. I speak to you personally that all things are possible if you will believe. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us. We're going to take time, and we're going to do the same thing we just did. What did the Lord speak to us this morning? I know, I know that this may seem orchestrated to you, like we planned this or something, because both of those words included scriptures that are actually in my sermon today. You will hear me repeat the same things that were just said in my sermon. And I manuscript my sermon, so if you need to read it and see it before I say it, that's okay. I'll do that. And these are things that only the Spirit of God can orchestrate is what I'm saying. Amen. What did the Spirit of God speak to us this morning? It's a miracle word. Just believe. Listen to me. All things are possible. If will come, come. I know what you have need of. Praise God. Did you hear the first words of that interpretation? I speak to you personally. God's here. Amen. This is God's personal word to us. Amen. God is here. His presence is here. You know, something that I think is incredible. Some of you may have not experienced this before, but when Miss Lisa was being prayed for, she fell down. And, the, and that is biblical. It says in the scriptures in the book of John that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he identified himself. They were looking for Jesus. And when they asked, who is Jesus of Nazareth? And he replied, I am he. They fell back three times, not once, not twice, but three separate occurrences in the scriptures where people fell down because Jesus identified himself to them. Listen, I, I believe this with all my heart. It's ex very experiential. But when Jesus shows you who he is, 
in its fullness. I don't think your physical body can take you. I think you just fall out, to be honest with you. That's the reaction. Because that is who he is. He's the way maker. When things don't seem to compute in the physical realm, God's spirit does it. Amen.
still before the Lord. this prayer with me, the prayer of Samuel from the Old Testament. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we have all the kids come up? We're going to release you to Children's Church this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Would you stretch out your hands towards our children? Let's pray for them as they go to be discipled. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch our children. Lord God, that you'd be with them, that your grace would be shed abroad in their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would uh, uh, teach them to walk in your ways all the days of their life. Holy Spirit, fill their lives in such a manner, Lord, that they can never get away from you. That, Lord, that they would run towards the church, fall in love with the church, even with its inconsistencies and fallacies, Lord. Let us love learn to love, even from a young age, your church. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good job. Amen. Wow. 
I don't know if it was the worship set that was all about uh, the Lord's Prayer, which is not my kingdom, but thy kingdom be done. Both two songs were yeah. Yeah. not my will, but thy will, basically, uh, being prayed there. Um, don't know what it was exactly, but um, I'm so thankful that God is present with Amen. us, that he's here. Um, would you open up your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 5? Luke chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 17. This is a two healing stories of Jesus. And can we're obviously continuing our, our I will summarize the last few weeks that I one week that I wasn't here, but I, I'll summarize the other two weeks uh, of uh, very shortly. But uh, Dr. Keener opens his book on miracles with a question of how we interpret events. Um, and so he posed us this question. He said, if a preacher gets struck by lightning, then how do we interpret the meaning of that event. For some, they would say, well, God is judging a hypocrite. For others, they would say, well, the devil hates preachers. You know, see the polar opposite of that. For others still, they would say, well, preachers shouldn't run around outside in the middle of a thunderstorm, right? <laughs> what you believe or the structure of your beliefs yes, will inform how you interpret events. It will also inform whether you not believe that God can heal and that healing is a real thing. Absolutely. What you believe about God and what God can do will directly affect how you interpret the events and evidence yeah. that God is yeah. interacting with us. If you believe God is the God of miracles, then after a while, I'm, I'm, I'm really convinced that the terminal end of that belief is, is that everywhere you look, you'll see miracles. Yeah. I mean that life itself is an absolute miracle. I mean, I, th I think that with all my heart, that if you really believe that God is the God of miracles, that suddenly, after a while, you'll begin to believe that all of life is really a supernatural event. Absolutely. That God interacts and lives with us in the midst of our existence in and of itself yeah. is a miracle. I was uh, fishing one time in Florida, and I caught this large cobia, and yesterday I wore a hat, and I had the the hook that that fish straightened uh, in my hat. That's what you do as a fisherman. When somebody, when you, you catch a fish that straightens a hook and you return that hook, you keep it in your hat. It's, it's, a, it's a sign. It's an accolade. But I remember that we were videoing this, catching this fish. And, um, and as I pulled the fish onto the boat, um, uh, I, I looked at the hook and I said, I, this was the first words out of my mouth. This is a fishing miracle. That's what I said. It's a fishing miracle. Now, I know that's hyperbole, really, in and of itself. There are fishermen, Lisa Smither would be one of them, that's got a few straightened hooks in her hat, right? Uh, but to land a fish that can straighten the hook is really among fishermen kind of a miracle moment, okay? And so uh, even though that's hyperbole, I want to clearly define what I mean by a miracle. And it's this, a divine action that goes beyond the course of nature and generates all. A divine, let me say that clearly, a divine action, meaning this is of God, an action of God that goes beyond the course of nature and generates all. So in the first week, I established the experiential and yet biblical proportions of how, that Jesus is the contemporary healer in our lives. Not only is the world desperate need of healing, I believe, uh, we are in need of healing as a means to get back in the fight, to yeah. continue life. To continue fighting for what we believe in and as we move forward towards the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God moves forward to us. In the second week, we read how Mary is a prototype of the spirit-filled life. The spirit overshadows Mary, and we read that Mary is filled uh, with Jesus, that the Holy Spirit prepares a place in Mary uh, for Jesus to reside. And that is the spirit-filled life, that we open ourselves up in the void and the emptiness of life without God. The Holy Spirit comes and fills us just as he filled Mary. And the Spirit overshadows us. And he's not just with us, but the Spirit is in us. There's a, there's a clear delineation there. It's not just that God is with us, but God is actually residing in our physical and mortal bodies. God loves our physical bodies enough to dwell in them, not just without them, but actually in them. This is encouraging to all of us to know that God is near, and he is near 
to our physical bodies. And when healing does for us all, even if we're bystanders, even, even if we're doubters for that matter, healing draws our attention to the possibility that God is actually participating with his people. The God of the universe cares enough about me to touch my body and heal it. That's what I'm saying. Like even if, even if you haven't experienced it, you have to like look on and say, "Wow, God cares enough Amen. to touch that person's body." Even if you're a complete doubter, you have yeah. to question. Yeah. You're like, no. "Does he really do that? Does he really care enough?" Yes, he does. Not only this, but healing becomes a sign that God really is with us and in us. So let's read the scriptures this morning as we. Read these a few accounts by Luke in Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 31. I'll read in the New American Standard Bible this morning. It says this in verse 17. One day when Jesus was preaching, there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying a man on a stretcher who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of Jesus. But when they did not find any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof. And they let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. It's an interesting word there. Your sins are forgiven. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began thinking there of the implications of of this saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins except God alone? Well, there's your answer right there. Yes, Jesus is yes, God. Sir. Verse 22, but Jesus, aware of their thoughts, responded to them and saying, why are you thinking this way in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, get up. Pick up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Yes, sir. And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were also filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. The second account of healing and restoration, verse 27. And after that, he went out and he looked, for a tax, looked at a tax collector named Levi, or Matthew, yes, as we sir. often call him sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind, and he got up, and he began following him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling to his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinners. Would you say that verse with me one more time? It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinners. Lord, I pray that you would drive your word deep into our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name. I have a blood blister on my thumb, and this is a relatively small one, but they're not an unusual occurrence for me. Uh, You're working on something, you pinch your finger, and you get a blood blister. Now, what's interesting about a blood blister is, is that it's not only a response to an injury, but it's also a healing response of your body. And so blood blisters remind me of of really of of two things, basically. Uh, The first one is, is that the blister itself is not just that reaction, but it's also a reaction of healing that comes to our bodies. That your bodies have been designed and designed in such a way that they can actually heal themselves. Now that's incredible, isn't it? That your epidermis is so well designed that it not only makes this as a healing uh, moment in your body, but it also seals it over so that it's protected from other infection because it's actually sealed. And then secondly, it reminds me of the fact that the blooded hands of Jesus yes, sir. are the things that provided for that in the first place. Before the foundations of the earth, 
Christ Jesus himself, the plan of salvation, and the fact that he would one day go to the cross and suffer upon the cross, and the nails would be driven in his hands and his feet, and his side would be pierced, was a plan that was enacted before even the foundations of the world existed. His blooded hands caused us to be able to interact in this life and live this life even as a possibility. And then on top of that possibility that the God of the universe wants to interact and know you and cares about you and wants to dwell in your mortal body. Amen. That's quite incredible. I get all that from a blood blister. You should see if I get a splinter what happens. You know what I'm saying? There's the cross right there, right? <laughs> These things are reminders to us that God loves us and cares about what happens to our physical body. It cares about even what we do with our physical bodies. I really can't emphasize that enough. Uh, next week we're going to talk a little bit about this. and I don't want to give it away, but we're going to talk about whether you believe the gospel or you obey the gospel. Which one is it really? God cares about what you do with your body. So much so that when scripture says that when you sexually sin, that you actually are sinning against your own physical body. There's a, lot to, there's a lot in there. God considers us special enough to have a divine relationship with him, and it was all through this divine action on his part to make that possible. Even if you don't believe, the presence of people's beliefs and claims that they've been healed will draw your, interact, draw your attention to God's interactions in the world. This is what I mean by the meaning of signs, that there would be signs that God's among us. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I mentioned to my neighbor at the end of the road uh, that I had castrated my billy goat. And his immediate reply was, man, I don't know what the signs are right now. Now, some of you who come from an agrarian, maybe mountain background, knew exactly what he's talking about. I knew a little bit of what he was talking about just because of things that I've read. But he was talking about mainly what's considered the farmer's almanac. The farmer's almanac will give you signs that it's okay to castrate your billy goat. Or that if you put cedar shingles on your roof at a particular season, that if you put them on in a certain day that the signs are, they won't bend up and not seal. Or if you canned all your vegetables without the signs, probably your vegetables aren't going to seal. Your jars won't actually seal. These are all signs, if you will. I, I personally, I believe that's just a bunch of Malarkey, basically, you know, we'll put it in some terms, hogwash or whatever uh, older terms that I could come up with. I think it's, it makes just about no sense to me personally. Uh, but I get it, and some people believe in that. Well, one time, uh, uh, somebody in my congregation told me that I need to put rock on my driveway now because it won't sink because the signs are right. I believe that one, okay? I went, I went with that one. I don't want my rock to sink either. I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that the biblical ideology of the word sign is exactly the same. There's signs that God is among us. Yes. And healing yes. is a sign that God is interactive. He's with us. Someone getting healed is a sign that God is actually working among his people. Yes, sir. The rainbow in the Old Testament was a sign that God's promise was with us. Right. Circumcision. Believe that or not, was a sign that God's people were his covenant people. Right. Signs are signals that communicate a message to the world that we are God's people and yeah. that God is actually working among us. Yeah. All of this is, of course, based on your interpretation of the signs. For the Israelites, they sang the Song of Moses in the Old Testament. The Song of Moses was recounting the incredible nature of God's deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, if you take that as a song, it was actually put into song that the signs of God were among them. Uh, Pharaoh didn't believe that those same signs were actually God's working among them. So much so that he didn't believe that they were God's sign. When God parted the Red Sea at Moses' yeah, staff, yeah, yeah. Pharaoh said, well, I'm going in there too. And you see how that went for him. Yeah. He didn't believe the sign. His interpretation of the sign caused his own demise and most of his army's demise. Signs invite us to faith in God. They invite us, they draw us, they garner our attention to, to the fact that God is participating with us. Yes. 
Now, uh, just to give you a little bit of insight into my daily, weekly uh, sort of schedule, every Thursday is when I block out time, and I'm very disciplined in this, uh, that Thursday is kind of my pastoral uh, day. And so although I usually study and do other things, uh, usually the afternoons are blocked out for visitation to hospitals, nursing homes, phone calls, and text messages. Since the advent of text messaging, we text message a whole lot as pastors. I'll just let you know that. After all, that's what pastors do. They pastor people, okay? Or at least that's what they should be doing, okay? And so uh, on Thursdays, I have this dedicated time of prayer for our members and those in need in our church. And, and it reminded me this past week, and in 2003, there was a movie uh, that I remember quite well. It was called Bruce Almighty. Anybody remember Jim Carrey and Bruce Almighty? It's a very <laughs> comical movie. It's where Jim Carrey uh, gets this taste of what it's like to be God. Morgan Freeman is God, and he plays the character very well. And so uh, Jim Carrey gets these powers from Morgan Freeman, uh, you know, godlike powers to do all these miraculous things. And then all of a sudden, one night in the middle of the night, uh, Jim Carrey wakes up, and he hears all these murmurs of prayers. And he's so despondent and confused by the event, all of a sudden Morgan Freeman shows up and begins to explain that that was just the prayers of the people in a few streets in Buffalo. Not, e not even the world itself, but there are people all over the world praying and that God is actually able to not just process the fact that people are praying, but he's actually individually able to process the fact that those people are praying and then to respond to their needs. I mean, Garth Brooks got this. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers, right? I mean, come on. If Garth Brooks gets it, you guys got to be able to get this. I'm just saying that, that we can see in this scripture that Luke is coupling these healing stories together and offers us this great understanding of the caring and praying for one another. Yeah. Even if you're unable to get in to see Jesus, even if you're able, unable to get your friends in to see Jesus, prayer allows us the way to rip off Jesus' roof and lower our friends and family right. members down and let them see the real Jesus, the God of the Bible. Yes, the God of scriptures who is living in us and with us. Just as those friends ripped off the roof and lowered their friend down, we can do that in prayer. And God will hear us. Yes, sir. Jesus allowed it. He didn't say, roll them back up, did he? <laughs> Fix the roof now. More than likely, this was his own home in Capernaum. Yes. And he just had his roof exposed. Skylight now, I guess, is what it was. Luke places these healing stories in a very specific order for a reason, I believe. First, because if you remember, Luke is a medical doctor. If Luke, being a medical doctor, any moment of healing that Jesus does would have, I mean, would have been an incredible moment for, for, for Luke. To watch these healing arts of Jesus through the power of divine intervention or miracle, as we've kind of explained before by definition, to see them interact. Where Luke is taking this from a whole different framework, not to say that it's not divine, but obviously to understand that Luke is taking it from a much more physical perspective or fleshly perspective, if we can put it in those terms. And yet he sees the divine interaction of God through the healing arts of Jesus himself. And so secondly, I believe that Jesus is simply identifying himself. Jesus is the great physician. And he makes his, this terminology very synonymous with himself. He's a, he says, you know, it's the sick who need a doctor, not the well. Right. One thing, he's basically defaming those whose detractors, saying, well, you guys think you're well, so you don't need anything. Right. It's not a, not a great indictment by Jesus right there. And then on top of that, he says, it's the sick. It's those who are wounded and those who have been wounded by sin and the enemy and Satan. They're the ones who need a doctor. And I am that doctor is what Jesus is saying. I am the great physician. You can see even in the language that happens here. I mean, we live in a, in a culture where there is a specialized doctor for everything. I mean, everything. If your foot hurts, that's a podiatrist. If your arm hurts, that's a, I don't know. Kinetic doctor? I'm not really sure. Whatever. If your brain hurts, that's a neurologist. You know, there's, there's a doctor for everything. And 
Jesus is, is treating the whole human experience. He's treating all of it. He doesn't give referrals. Did you know what said about Jesus? He's not saying, well, you got to go see this guy down the road. See the lady at the desk, and she'll sign you up for a, a visit with him. No, Jesus treats the entire human experience, all of it, both your soul, your mind, your body, all that you are, even the social constructs. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But you see in the language that Luke uses here that he's linking these two stories in particular. The paralyzed man is being carried. He's immobile. We see that very clearly. This is not only a hint to the fact that his physical body is, is degraded and he's paralyzed, but it's also a hint to the fact that he is paralyzed in sin. Anybody ever feel like that before? You've been paralyzed, immobilized by the enemy, held in bondage to sin? Anybody been in bondage to sin in here? Anybody been set free? Yeah. Amen. That's what's happening here in the spiritual realm as well as the physical realm. It's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. It's your body and your souls are inextricably linked. Can't separate. They're, they're one and the same, essentially. And so we also see that, 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 that this man is hemmed in by, his, by the enemy to his sins. But Levi, Matthew, the tax collector, our friend, how does the, the scripture read? Matthew was in his tax booth. Now, for me, I begin to image this, this, this little booth, basically, kind of ragtag set together, and there's bars on the outside, you know, like a teller's window. He's not just being protected from people outside of him, but he's being contained by the Roman government, too. He's hemmed in. He's held in bondage. And if you read the scripture, you'll notice that in some ways, I believe that he's implying that that Levi is trapped in by his lifestyle too. And if you read closely, both Levi and the paralyzed man, Jesus allows them to get up and walk. It says specifically, Jesus says to the man, take up your stretcher and walk. Go home. And then he looks at Levi and says, follow me. It's all the same. Your sins are forgiven. Follow me. Get up and walk. It's all the same thing. It's all the same calling. Absolutely. All the same redemption. Levi is said to have immediately after that moment, he left everything and exactly the same wording. Read it tonight if you don't believe me. He got up and he walked. He followed Jesus. It's the same story. It's the same redemption. And then we even take it further to that when he's throwing this great feast, at his house. Levi is throwing this great feast and reception for Jesus. Now all of a sudden there's this great social reconstruction that happens. Yeah. Jesus not only heals Levi, but he or, or forgives him of his sins, his debts, but he's also forgiven his debts to the Israelite community too. Jesus yeah. restores him back. This is beyond comprehension. I'm, I'm, it's, it's not just your soul. It's not just your sins. It's not just your physical body. It's the social environment that you dwell in, too. How many of you, upon coming to Jesus Christ, had relationships in your family restored that only God could have done? How many, after coming to Jesus Christ, have you had social relationships that you were in, that you never should have been in, that you got out of? Only God could do. And Jesus cares so much about you that it's not just your sins that can be forgiven. It's the entire sphere of your social interactions that he can forgive and he can redeem. Get up and walk is what Jesus says. Paralytic walked for the first time since his paralysis. Levi walked away from the tax booth to follow Jesus. This speaks directly to the fact that when Jesus heals... He sets your soul free along with your body. Not only this, but he sets the entire social aspects of your entire being free. And it can walk. You know, doctors exist because they have knowledge of how to cure the body of ailments. And Jesus himself reveals uh, that, that he can treat the entire human condition yes, sir. of brokenness of body, soul, and society. Early Pentecostals, it's quite interesting as I was reading this, and 
uh, knowing Pentecostal history, I, I realized that early Pentecostals at the big turn of the 20th century really had a, a quite a um, uh, mistrust of doctors. Let's just say that, okay? It was frequently referred to in sermons. Um, remember the healing of the women with the issue of blood? You know what scripture says there? It says that now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all her money on physicians, anybody ever done that before? Uh, spent all their money on physicians, <laughs> nobody could heal her. Nobody could, nobody, nobody could cure her. She touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Yes, sir. Everything changes. Yeah. Jesus' healing is free, by the way. I just want to make sure that you know that. There's no co-pays. There's no charges. There's no windows to visit on your way out. Don't even need a referral. There's no insurance accepted. Yes, sir. Jesus. I'm not, I'm not purporting, uh, to, purporting to any mistrust of doctors by any stretch. But I am asking you to know that there is a great physician who lives and who's alive today. And when doctors wring their hands and say there's nothing else we can do, there's a physician that exists who can do all things. Who can do all things. Alice Flower, one of the early spouses of the early Pentecostals, uh, specifically in the Assemblies of God, wrote a, a poem reflecting on the Holy Spirit as a life-giving spirit. And for her, the spirit-filled life means the fullness of life and liberty, much like the paralytic or, or Levi experienced with Jesus. Listen to the words of this poem. Tis Jesus who quickens the body, frail dust in itself, but his life. Yeah. More abundant imparted brings healing and strength for each hour of the strife. Tis Jesus both now and forever, the same strong, compassionate Lord who said, I will leave thee, no, never. What a privilege to rest on his word, just Jesus, the temple all filling, his power permeating my frame till my soul is transported with glory and my lips can be but breath of his sweet name. Just Jesus, the Savior, all glorious, the message of true Pentecost, revealing forever just Jesus through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Notice, if you would, as we kind of examine that incredible poem, the paradoxical language of the poem itself. She says, life is both filled with strength and strife. Yeah. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Both healing and fragility. Right. Both a body that is dust yet filled with the life of Christ. I love what Paul says. It's very similar to this. He says, outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Oh, what a paradox of life. The body of dust yet filled with the life of Christ, infilling of the emptiness of our frame. I know it may seem to you mutually exclusive, but I believe it's okay to have these tensions of both pains in your body, yes, and yet sir. despite them, realizing that we have a freedom and a life and a liberty that those without Jesus have never known. Perhaps my favorite quote is by the Pentecostal theologian Stephen Jack Land. He's a Church of God theologian. He says this. We are an action learning and teaching people. We live in the spirit who are in the world but not of the world. We're already saved but not yet resurrected. We're already healed but we're dying. We're already filled with longing for the day when God will be all in all. Having limited abilities but the unlimited power and gifts of God. Living in readiness for the return of the Lord but not knowing when it will be. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On more than one occasion, I've experienced and seen firsthand this very paradox. I've been on multiple occasions at the federal medical facility. I've been to jails. Uh, the federal medical facility is a prison in Lexington uh, with, Char with Chaplain Tom Caldwell on multiple occasions. And I've heard testimonies, firsthand testimonies over and over again about people who have gone to prison, gone to jail. And somewhere, some way, in a church service in prison on the inside or in a Bible study, they found Jesus. Maybe just reading a track in their cell. Maybe just in prayer. Reminiscing the, the, the thoughts of their younger youth. Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe grandma prayed for them. Yes, all. Sir. And they'll make some type of testimony and they'll say, it was there in that prison cell behind bars that I was the freest I've ever been in my entire life. 
That's the paradox of Pentecost. That's the paradox of Christian life that I'm talking about. Paul said it best in Philippians chapter 4. I have learned the secret of what it means to be content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Everything. It's, it's, a, it's a literal catch-all of Christian life. You can get through it. Whatever situation you're in, you can get through it by the strength of God. The Spirit of God who is living in you and dwelling in your mortal body, you can get through this. Whether it's a physical ailment, whether it's a mental ailment, whether it's something else that's happening right now, let me ensure you and encourage you today. You have the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to get through it today. No matter what the situation, whether hungry, well-fed, Whatever it may be, you can get through it. As long as we live in these old bodies, we will have tensions like this. And yet we can find the strength in Jesus Christ, not only to live with these tensions, but to thrive in the midst of them. Yeah. Um, you guys know this, but uh, a lot of my doctoral research was, was based in uh, family systems theory. And I consider myself a family systems theorist. In that regard, it's a psychological backing that, that has a lot of influence on uh, the spiritual life. And um, one of the aspects of that is, is I think about often is, is that uh, high functioning people and low functioning people. And some people out of their anxieties of what's happening in life will over function. I mean, they're busy all the time and they never slow down to stop and think about things. They can't rest, essentially. They, they have no idea what Sabbath means or to rest in God. Because they're just busy all the time, all the time, all the time. And then the, on the other side of that perspective, some people low function. So when they have all this anxiety pent up inside them, they'll just stop functioning completely. They just won't do it anymore. Maybe in the workplace you've seen that. Anybody seen some non-functioners in the workplace before? I mean, the state government. I think most of you are non-functioners. But anyway, I'm just saying. You get what I'm saying here, right? Low function. I'm sorry. That was a shot right there. <laughs> Did you work for the state? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were a government employee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> High-functioning people, low-functioning people. And it's really not an easy thing to strike the, the, the middle ground there. To be at perfect rest and at the same time busy. Again, I'm not asking you to, 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 to reconcile them. I'm saying they're both mutually dwelling together. To be able to rest in Christ, but yet be busy about the Lord's work at the same time. I know it doesn't seem to make sense, but it's true. And so, let me, let me finish by saying this, in, in the midst of all of that, that tension, if you will. There's a theologian named Michael Bird. Uh, he's an Australian. He tells a story that when he was a kid, there was a 1980s French cartoon called uh, The Robo Story that he loved. And the story goes like this. I'll just kind of encapsulate it in a nutshell. It says, in the cartoon, there's a girl uh, and her dog who accidentally get onto a rocket and they blast off into space on this foreign planet. They land on this foreign planet and they're stuck there. And there's good robots on that planet and there's bad robots on that planet. And so they befriend some of these good robots. And one of those robots is the comedic relief. He, he's called Robo Hobo is what they call him. And he doesn't really do anything. Most of the time, he kind of spends his time uh, getting drunk on oil, I think is what the, the idea is. He's just, he's just a comedic relief. And yet, he's a good friend of this little girl and her dog. Yes, sir. And so then there's this other robot who appears miraculously, kind of in and out. He just flashes in, flashes out, yet he saves the day every time. They're in some perilous situation. The conflict arises in the rising action, and here comes this robot. They don't really know who he is. They just know that he comes in, and he saves the day, and then he leaves. And so finally, it wraps up to the end of the series, and the little girl figures they, the, the robot, the good robots figure out how to make a, a rocket and send her back to Earth. And, and as she's in the midst of this, and uh, the, the uh, switch is flipped too early, and some of the robots that she was going to take home with her don't get to go. And it's just her and her little dog and Robo Hobo that blast off into space. And as she's blasting off and back to Earth and she knows that she's saved and everything's okay, she begins to lament. Ah, I wish 
that hero robot would have been able to go home with us. And she's lamenting as the kind of communication device with the good robots begins to fizzle out. And then all of a sudden she looks over and Robo Hobo unmasks himself as the hero robot. He says, I wasn't really Robo Hobo. I was here all along. I didn't go away and come back. I was here the entire time. It's a little bit like the story of the road to Emmaus. These two disciples walking away from Jerusalem after Jesus is put into the tomb after the cross. And as he's put into the tomb, you realize at that moment, this paradox happens. These two disciples are walking with the resurrected, crucified, risen Lord. And they have no clue that it's him. Jesus was there all along. Even in the anxieties of feeling that he's not there. He's present. Even in those moments where life seems so dark. In those moments where it, it seems so hard and your physical body doesn't do what you tell it to do. He's there. Every time, he's there. Even when we may not feel God's presence. Or to put it in terms of the song this morning, see how orchestrated this was of the Holy Spirit? Even when I don't think he's working, I know he's working. Even when you may not feel God's presence, he's here, he's near. God is with us and in us. Even when we suffer, He's with you. He's in you. Even when you feel empty, even when you feel full, He's here. Yes, sir. The story reads by that beautiful poem, Footprints in the Sand. Remember at the end of the poem, there's these two footprints that, that are walking seamlessly side by side in the sand. All of a sudden, one of them disappears. And then the poet asks, Lord, where were you in the times when life was so hard and travail was so bad in the darkest valleys of my life, where were your footprints? And the Lord says, my footprints were always there. I was carrying you. It's your footprints that weren't there. He's always with us. Even when life gets hard. Even when it seems tragic and paradoxically like, where's God now? God's presence is here. He's with us at all times. And it's the Lord that was carrying you when it seemed like he wasn't here. It was him all along. He's with us. He's in us. When you feel desperately absent to God, know that he's with you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and see? Lord, there's somebody here I know today that feels just apart from God, that feels far from Him, that feels like His presence is nowhere to be found. Lord, I ask in Your precious name that You would reveal Yourself to them right now. Lord, stretch out Your hands to heal their bodies, heal their minds, heal the social aspects of life, all encompassing. No referrals here, Lord. Just stretch out your hands and touch them. If that's you and you just need a divine touch of God, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you to reach out your hand. Literally, like the woman with the issue of blood reached out her hand to touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. If you need to feel a special touch of God, just reach your hand out and say, Lord, I want to touch you. I want to feel your presence. I need your presence even when I don't feel that you're here, I believe you. I want to touch you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And one last thing. Before we begin this series, I told you that this is an experiential series. That every Sunday we're going to pray over somebody. And I, I didn't ask rehearse this, but I want I would appreciate if Carol and Paul Paul, sorry. Anyway, if we could if we can have the church just come 
surround you guys and pray for you this morning. Is that okay? I didn't ask for permission before, so I apologize. But can we surround this incredible couple right now and just lay hands on them and just pray God's touch? Yeah, if you can come up, that'd be great. And we just want to pray the Lord's touch on both their physical bodies. As you know, Carol has had some issues with her heart. Paul Paul has some, uh, been battling cancer for a long time, and the Lord has been so gracious to him. And so let's just surround them and pray for them and just to let them know the love of Jesus and, and, and the, the love of his church is, is surrounding them right now. Would you? And as we come, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for this family, Lord God, that your hand of, of grace and joy and peace and renewal would be upon Steve and upon Carol, Lord Jesus. Lord, touch their bodies. Touch Carol's heart, Lord Jesus. Let it be and continue to be in perfect rhythm. Let the tiredness and anything else that's associated with it, Lord Jesus, any immune response, Lord, be restored and healed. Lord, touch Steve, Father God, specifically, I pray that you begin to continue, I should say, to renew his body and strengthen his body in, in just miraculous ways, Lord God. Lord, every sign and every symptom and, and every side effect, Lord Jesus, of what he goes through on a daily basis, I just pray that you would renew his body. Be gracious, Lord. Dispense your spirit in a powerful and new way. Energize and charge them, Lord God. Let your grace just fill them with power of the Spirit, I pray, who is in them and with them and among them. Surely, Lord Jesus, your presence is here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all for praying. Appreciate that so much. Appreciate you all. The experiential side of what it means to believe that Jesus is our healer. One last thing I, I, I would like to do is before we depart is that we'll just simply, uh, I just want to bless you. And I know we went a little bit long, so uh, you can stay and listen to Ryan sing if you want to. But anyway, uh, let, me, let me pray. Let me pray for you. Would you hold up your hand just, just, just as like you're going to receive something right now. Father, I pray that you would bless us, that you would keep us. That you would turn your face towards us. That the light of the glory of your face would shine upon us. That you'd be gracious unto us. Lord, and that you would give us your peace, I pray. Your peace. Yes. Yes. Let us know, Lord, have that sense of peace in our hearts and minds. That you're with us. That your presence is here. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said together, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Remember that this afternoon, 3 to 4 p.m., we have Acts of Harvest. If you come in a little bit early, we'd appreciate it to help serve our community. Um, also remember the sign-up sheet in the back uh, for parking for the 127 yard sale. And uh, there's probably something else, but I'll remember next week. Anyway, be blessed. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. <laughs>